Hey everybody, welcome to the Going Ballistic Podcast. I'm your host, I'm your co-host, Ryan Kleckner, and I'm here with <laughs> the other co-host, Jason Kleckner. How you doing, bud? Good, man, good. Getting caught up with work this week, getting back from my deer trip. So, uh, Yeah, tell me about it. What are you getting caught up from? What were you doing? Uh, as far as work? No, why, why, why were you out of town? Oh, no. We went on the deer hunt we were talking about. and Uh Aha. How'd it go for you? Well, I got a nice little two-by-two, but it wasn't what I expected. So I lugged around, and I don't know how heavy that gun is. I'm going to guess 12 pounds. I lugged around that 12-pound gun for three days, all ready for my my long-range shot out to 500 yards. And I ended up killing one at like 75. (laughs) But that's okay. I still got one. So how how far was the shot you actually took? I missed it. Uh, 75 yards. Oh, that's funny. Oh, well, 12 pounds isn't that bad. It's a good workout for you. People pay a gym membership, and you got to work out for free, dude. Yeah, I guess that's one way to look at it. But I will say this, man. It it was a lot of fun. We had a blast. Um, I got to go to some new areas that I've never hunted before, thanks to our little uh, rhino that we have. Mm-hmm. So that was fantastic. All right. So which is it? Are you complaining about carrying on a 12 pound rifle? Or are you going to tell us about driving around in a rhino? Uh, I'm going to complain about carrying die. around. <laughs> I'm going to complain about carrying around a 12 pound rifle, not being able to make this shot that I've been practicing on for a year straight. Well, remember if your biggest risk of failure, you get your target shooting. And if the biggest risk a failure is spooking the animal than you're hunting. So I'm glad you didn't do any long range shooting and calling it hunting. I'm glad you got close. <laughs> well, it wasn't even like I stalked it close though, man. I, I had hiked. I don't know how far I hiked a long ways that morning. Mm-hmm. And we came back and we were actually headed into camp. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a matter of fact, we were going to go meet everybody for your dad's birthday. And on our way back to camp, we, Kicked him up right there on the side of the road. Ended up getting off the road and walking in a little ways, and then that's it where I ended up shooting him. Nice. So, for those of you that follow along on my Instagram, you notice know that I went back home to Arizona for my dad's birthday. It was a surprise trip, uh, so I didn't want to say anything about it because I didn't want him to know. And I brought my daughter Alice with me. It was a fun trip for her. Oh, uh, I ended up getting a neat experience with her. And that going to the airport super early in the morning as we're going off to the airport, she was even surprised that morning. I got a really cool chance as a dad to go through the newsstand, you know, store and go, hey, Alice, come here. Come check this out. We went over to the magazine rack. I picked up the issue of Concealment Magazine where they have me in there. I'm like, check this out. And I flipped up the magazine and got to show a picture of her dad, which that was cooler for me, of course, but neat to take a picture (laughs) to... You know, get to show that to your kid was kind of neat. We had a great time. It was good seeing you guys. I'm so glad you made it in. Um, Will you finish telling me about the bullet, though? Because I'm curious about the bullet you shot the deer with and what happened to it. That didn't actually happen. When I butchered that thing up, all that was fine. Um, Can you catch everybody else up? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I I ended up, uh, as this deer was topping the hill, I ended up shooting him in the the top of the shoulder. because That's all I could see. That in his head. Mm-hmm. And when I had, uh, after I'd got it and got it back to camp and started to skin it on the, the right side, it looked like a big dark streak down the back strap. And I was really disappointed because I thought where I had hit the top of that shoulder blade, the bullet had actually turned or fragmented and turned and went down the back strap. And I mm-hmm. was, I was really disappointed about that. Um, that was not the case. That was actually just on top. And I don't think the bullet skimmed down anything. I think what happened is it just blooded, you know, like it either ruptured a vein or, or something erupted a, above it. Mm-hmm. So when I, when I actually boned it out, the back straps were perfectly fine. So it, it didn't do what I thought it did. It, what it, bullet was it again? Uh, I was hunting with the uh, 168 grain Sierra. Botel oh, hollow points. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, then that actually had to have exploded into the shoulder blade or something because I didn't find any pieces of bullet when I was butchering up the meat. Um, so either it exited out or or wherever it went. I didn't find an exit hole at all. I mean, there was just one in and that was it. 
but uh, but no, I was so happy that that backstrap didn't get ruined because it sure looked like it hit and turned and and just you know messed up the top of it. Well, but... Good, I'm glad it worked. I mean, for years, I and everyone else seemed to believe that the you know Sierra Match Kings you can't use those for hunting, but you know they perform okay. I, I, I'm sorry to be crass, but on 180 pound two leg targets, why wouldn't they do the same on a 200 pound four legged target? You know, right. So uh, it's legal for hunting. It's not a full metal jacket. They actually open up and, and expand pretty well. Uh, and you said you didn't even have an exit. So there you go. You dumped a whole lot of energy into that animal. Oh, and, yeah. He dropped yeah. right there. Yeah. Well, what more could you ask for? A humane kill. And you got some meat. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. So and my dad, he was huge help. So we actually got back home. Uh, we boned everything out before we left. Mm -hmm. and then of course got home and butchered the whole thing up in i don't know probably three hours got everything vacuum sealed and hamburgered up and so he was a huge help helping me get that done all right jason i want you to do something for us uh you can say no but i want you to prepare for some future episodes maybe the next one or soon talk us through how you quarter things in the field because you have a pretty slick way of doing it and even when it comes to butchering would you mind going through like a whole jason kleckner how to butcher an animal sure in your garage you think you could Absolutely. talk through that like you know the the tools or best practice i've never done it i've yeah. field dressed animals before but we've always used game processors as a matter of fact now i'm so spoiled uh the last couple deer i've got here in tennessee they actually when i went to gut it i was with a good friend of mine on his property and i got up to the deer and threw my pack down and pulled out my knife and flipped him over and he goes what are you doing i said i'm gonna gut him he said, why? I said, well, because it's going to go bad. He's like, dude, you don't live in the desert anymore. It's not going to go bad in like 30 minutes. It's like, and by the way, the game processor is 20 minutes away. You, you pay them an extra 15 bucks or 20 bucks and the kids do it there for you. Like, well, that's the best 20 bucks I've ever spent. <laughs> you just pick the whole thing up and throw it in the truck and you drive down to the game processors, drop the deer off, and you can actually be back out and hunting with your, for your buddy's deer. So I'm getting worse for getting out of practice. And you're doing like full elk, vacuum sealing, all the cuts and everything by yourself now, right? Yeah. So um, we spent three days butchering up three elk uh, from our, our last elk hunt that we went on. So elk, elk take a lot longer. It's a lot more meat and yeah. just keeping it cold and everything. But um, so like for deer, especially like in this case, um, you know, I, I still gutted it and just hiked it out, you know, tied its feet together and, and packed it out to where I could get it to the road and then picked it up at the rhino. Right. Elk, on the other hand, um, we don't gut them anymore. We started not doing that a few years ago. I know, and you've explained it to me, and I've seen a YouTube video just quickly on it, but the whole concept of being able to quarter it all there and get all the cuts of meat out without having to take like kind of the main carcass or the guts is kind of cool. Oh, it's amazing. And it's so fast. And it's cool because when when you actually cut up around, you know, like you start with the back legs and mm -hmm. open them up and just follow that, you know, where the crease is right down to the socket, pop the socket with your knife and just cut around the meat and it literally falls off. And you still have the hair and hide to protect the meat. We leave that on. Yeah. While we're carrying it and dragging it around and then skin mm -hmm. it when we get back to camp. You know, and, and it's the same thing with the fronts. And then you cut the back straps out. And then uh, as far as the tenderloins, you literally make a small incision behind the last rib and you can reach up underneath there and just cut it right off. So the only thing that you're not taking is really the little strips of meat between the ribs. And you can take those if you want to. Um, we typically don't take it. And then, of course, the neck we take. A lot, some people don't take that either, but we, we make a lot of hamburger out of the neck. So that yeah. I usually just haul with the head. And that's probably the heaviest chunk to carry. Sure. Um, but there is and, and the cool... one most likely to get shot carrying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but there are some really cool videos online. There's a guy that shows you how to do it in 10 minutes, under 10 minutes. Uh, and wow. he literally does it in under 10 minutes, has the whole thing done. Uh, I'm not that fast. It still probably takes me 20, 30 minutes to do yeah, the well, whole thing. I think but... I know I'd like to hear it. I think some of the, uh, the listeners out here would like to hear it too. I just need you to not only make sure you get your notes all together for us, but also I don't know how you'll be able to do it but i trust you will uh explain it to us on audio only like how to do it or <laughs> you know lessons you've learned or gear we should get should we get a vacuum sealer should we not you know things like that yeah we basically have a vacuum sealer a good vacuum sealer 
and a good grinder. Mm -hmm. Um, and then of course we like mostly steaks, so we cut as many steaks as possible. Uh, we'll keep a couple roasts for the Traeger and then, and, and I'll get more explicit into it. And this is all yeah. learned from my wife, by the way, my wife taught me That's how to awesome. butcher. I forget. Animal. Did we tell that story? There's two stories about you and butchering. I don't know if we've told yet. We've been doing this too long. Well, the first time I killed an elk and brought it home, uh, I first time you killed an elk while you were married to her, to her. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I brought it home and I'm like, Hey, uh, I'll be back. I got to go drop this off at the, uh, you know, the processor and have them start going through the, the works on this and fill out some paperwork. And she's like, what are you crazy? Get that thing in here, man. We're going to do that ourselves. And I'm like, Whoa, I don't know how to butcher an animal. She's like, I do bring it in here. And away we went, man. So she, she took us through the, the whole process of how she was taught to do it. And it is actually much easier than you think. Now, are we making professional cuts like the butcher does? No. But we're getting beautiful steaks out of it, and and we take extra time to clean up more than you know the actual processor does. So our yeah. meat's actually way cleaner, is way prettier. Um, wow. And just for like for instance, um, on this trip, my dad had watched some video and we tried it and it worked great. We had never actually taken back straps and butterfly them before. We normally just mm -hmm. chop them up and they're small steaks. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually cut them thicker and then cut that almost in half and let it butterfly in half. And then you yep. get, you know, this way bigger steak. So that was pretty cool on this trip. Um, so we're still learning, but yeah. Well, let's get thing... through, I hate to break it to you, but before we get to the comments, uh, we had a Kleckner family, uh, kind of a fantasy football pool and we traded you for Twyla. Ah! <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> you guys probably made a good choice. <laughs> I'm going through some of the comments here. Man, everyone's happy to see us back. Guys, we're glad to be back. Sorry we had a couple weeks off. Just life gets in the way. Part of it was the surprise trip to Arizona and Jason out there hunting. Uh, one guy says, uh, well, uh, Robert says, hey, mount your rifle on your vehicle like the Rangers do. Always love the sand rails the Rangers had. I never had a sand rail, Robert. Uh, we had vehicle problems when we were over there, though. We had the Arsovs, the Ranger Special Operation vehicles didn't work right. So we tried out some Humvees and they didn't work right. So we bought a bunch of Toyota Hiluxes, brand new. Those things were awesome. So everyone got back and bought a Tacoma when they got back stateside because how great they were. And we had some <laughs> quads and dirt bikes and stuff like that. But uh, Tyler and Mr. Nice Knife and Paris George and Rick and Redleg and Steve. Hey, everybody. Mr. Nice Knife says, what do I think of a short 16 and a half inch 6.5 Creed bolt gun? Well, I love short barrels as a general rule on rifles because a, a long barrel does not make more accuracy, right? A short barrel is relatively easier to maneuver in and out of a vehicle or through the woods or whatever you're doing with it. However, the reason I like 6.5 Creed more is because of its ballistic performance. And getting too short of a barrel, you start to lose that performance because the performance comes with the velocity, kind of like 223 or 556. Five, you're getting a short barrel 223, someone wants an eight inch barrel 223 for an AR-15, cool i mean it's maneuverable and i just said that it's not going to be any more or less accurate necessarily that's yeah kind of true too but the whole thing the 223 or 556 has going for is its velocity same thing with 65 creedmoor and you get that short of a barrel you start getting a big fireball and you're wasting a lot of energy so i probably wouldn't like to go shorter than 20 20 inches on a 65 creedmoor i mean if you wanted one do it i just not saying i would give up the gun if i had one but much better with a short barrel than a 6.5 Creedmoor does. Red Leg asks if I had shoulder fired the punt gun for YouTube. If you follow me on Instagram or on Facebook, you've seen a couple pictures of me with an obnoxiously big shotgun. Did you get to see those, Jason? I did. Those are awesome. <laughs> uh, it's not even that big of a gun. I'm just really, really tiny. Um, that's not a real gun, guys. That was a prop. That was fake. And that's why we're out there just playing around with it. That was not real punt gun. So sorry to let you guys down. I'm glad everyone else is on here. A blind rodent says the bearded butcher have some good videos on butchering deer. Awesome. We'll check it out. Chris, we've missed you too, man. Blind rodent also wants to know, Jason, have you tried sous vide yet? No, you know, I haven't been able to talk my wife into it and she, she has to be on board before I make the purchase. So I, I've explained it to her. I showed the videos and dude, I knew we made a good choice picking her. Yeah. Well, <laughs> she hasn't, she hasn't bought one yet. Nor well, she it's, said, it, it's yeah, I'm Christmas interested. Eve. Well, now April and I know what to get you guys. <laughs> so, all right, Anthony. Uh, Jared says he's going to build a 6.5 Creed War to use for hunting and precision rifle matches. 
With the intro of the 6.5 PRC and the 300 PRC, should you wait and build one of those or stick with 6.5 Creedmoor? Great question, Jared. Uh, you're not going to like the answer, but it depends. So before I get into it, Jason, what do you think? Should he go to the 6.5 PRC or the 300 PRC, or should he stick with the 6.5 Creedmoor? What do you think? Well, I haven't shot any of those, but just based on how popular the 6.5 Creedmoor is, I'd go with the 6.5 Creedmoor, yeah, strictly on I... popularity. I think the 6.5 PRC was a mistake. I think the 6.5 Creedmoor is so popular already, and it's a short action, so it just makes a lot of sense. Now, maybe if the 6.5 PRC came out first or came out at the same time, it may have taken off better. It clearly is better performance on paper, but I just don't see the need for it. I actually think it's that falls into the category of what I think most uh, G Wiz new cartridges falls into, which is yeah, wow, it beats by this many percentage points. You know, this specification on paper, awesome. Don't know if it's enough to change over to. Now, the 300 PRC is that exception to the rule. I think that thing is awesome. If you guys follow me also on other social media, you'll see I got a bunch of ammo from Hornady. So, Hornady's awesome for helping taking care of me. They're making sure that on the elk hunt and I'm going on soon, I'll be taking 300 PRC with me and seeing how it performs. Uh, th those guys are neat. Not only do they know how to get a caliber out and design one, they know how to fill the market with it. And they know how to take care of people just by saying, yeah, dude, we'll send you some. Go try it out. Let us know what you think. And they actually want to know what I think. So that, that's just really neat. Great people. Can't say enough about them. Uh, and that 300 PRC is awesome. I think they made a mistake on that one, though. I wish they called it the 300 Creedmoor or the 7.5 Creedmoor or 7.6 Creedmoor, something like that, because it's so much closer to the Creedmoor in overall design. It's just the Creedmoor's big brother. Um, and I hope that the PRC name doesn't stick it too close to that 6.5 PRC. So uh, people asking what a short 6.5 still outperform a short 308. Uh, what do you mean by outperform? I don't know. If you get too short and you don't have the velocity, then no, a, a smaller bullet. So, guys, remember energy equation here, and that's why I said it be, depends on what you mean by outperform. If you're trying to actually hit a target with some energy, it may not. So, in the energy calculation, you have velocity and mass. You can either increase both, increase one, or increase the other. And so, the idea with 65 Creedmoor is you're getting a lighter bullet, so you have less mass, but you're picking up velocity. So, therefore, you can end up with more energy at a distance. Well, if you take a light bullet and make it go the same speed or slower, it's going to have less energy. It's not going to be going as fast, so it's not going to buck the wind as well, and you're going to lose a lot of the benefits of it. You know, and the, the drop, the, the vertical compensation you need to make for a bullet is directly related to how long it takes to get to the target. So making it slow, maybe it'll outperform it. I don't know. I just think it ruins the benefit of it. You know, I, I don't know why, why you would want to do that, because... You get a 6.5 grade more because you want kind of hot rod performance. If you want a short, handy gun, I'd get a 308 all day. Anything? Now, go ahead. I was going to say, also with the short barrel stuff, take that Q rifle, for instance. It's got a 16-inch mm -hmm. right or 16-inch barrel on it, right? For the 308, it does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just fine. Yeah, 308 can do that, though. Uh, the design of the 308 cartridge does not need much longer than that. My bolt gun 308 that I used in a lot of those early NSSF videos and I used to teach with had an 18 inch barrel. Shot out to, you know, a thousand just fine with it. It, it did not need a longer barrel. 6.5 Creedmoor, though, has a much bigger, you know, or a steeper drop off there. Anthony picked up a P365 this weekend. He took it out. It's awesome. Dude, I love mine. It's a game changer. Um, little does the magazines are starting to rust a little bit on me. So I got to be careful with the magazine steel. But despite that, Guys, uh, it's the same size as my 43, just as or more reliable and double the capacity. So enough about that. Uh, Tyler says, bought a Remington 765 Creed worth of Vortex PST thanks to us. Awesome, man. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, how do we feel about running a sunshade on your scope? Well, if you need it, put it on there. There's nothing wrong with it, and I've been in multiple instances where I've needed it. So, yes, do it. Matter of fact, uh, we're somewhere where we took uh, the ammo box and put it over the scope. We were shooting from one hillside to the other hillside. The sun was in our eyes so much that you actually could not see the target. So we took the cardboard ammo box and opened up both ends and slid it over the end of the scope and looked through that to make a sunshade, you know, that was to, to help us be able to see. So, yeah, sometimes we really need. Rick's doing sous vide. That's awesome. Uh, Red Leg wants to know if I think so. Uh, I know they will because I've seen the order. 
So there has been a unit in SOCOM that has already placed the order for the guns and 300 Peter C. And matter of fact, uh, I was out. One of those guns that you see in my photos of shooting the 300 Peter C is one of those guns. And maybe I even took a picture of their ammo. So yeah, they, they actually have already adopted it even before Hornady announced it. So that's how much the 300 Peter C is awesome. Um, Paris says, maybe others. You're right. May is the, the word. Uh, someone's considering assigning for a rocket FFL. Do I recommend getting product liability insurance? Sure. That's completely your choice though. I don't want to ever be on record saying yes or no. You feel that you want insurance, get insurance. It's not a bad idea. Um, and Dave asked, what's the difference between the 260 Remington and the 65 Creedmoor? Well, 260 Remington's got a little bit more case capacity, so you can actually get a faster bullet out of it. It can actually outperform the 65 Creedmoor, believe it or not. The 65 Creedmoor, though, can allow for a little bit longer bullets because the case is slightly shorter, so the bullet can stick out a little further, even though it's got less capacity. And a lot of people used to say, me included, if you're going to hand load, go 260 because you can get more performance. And if you're going to buy a factory, go 65 Creedmoor. But now the 65 Creedmoor is just so far and beyond taken off. There's absolutely no reason to get the 260 Remington. If you've got one already, keep it, enjoy it, shoot the heck out of it. But if you're going new, uh, the 260 Remington's dead, 651. You know, I was going to throw in too uh, from the deer hunt. I have to give a shout out to Leopold. Um, those guys were awesome to me. So my rangefinder on the deer hunt. Okay, I didn't hear about this. Talk to me. Oh, yeah, yeah. So my, my rangefinder, which is a Leopold 1200. Somehow, when I was hiking and dragging through bushes and stuff, uh, even though I, it's on my belt, and I don't know how it did it, but the battery cap somehow unscrewed and flipped off that thing. Okay. And rendered it useless, right? So the battery cap connects the back of the battery and allows it to power up. Yep, yep. So I searched everywhere, searched in my bag. It's gone. Uh, to finish out the hunt, I ended up taking a beer tab and breaking it in half to mm -hmm. the size of the battery, packing some cardboard over it and threw a zip tie over it and used that to make the connection to finish the hunt. Dude, I can so tell we're related. I'm going to wait. <laughs> so anyway, I get back and I start looking online. Of course, I can't find a replacement cap. So I, I send an email off to Leopold. Hey, I need to purchase a new battery cap for my rangefinder, and mm -hmm. you know, this this is what I think happened. And could you please let me know how much, and and we'll get this going. And this was late at night on a Friday. I didn't expect to hear it back till Monday, dude. It wasn't 15 minutes, and I got a response back. Not a problem. It's in the mail. You'll have it shortly. Wow. Yeah. So I emailed him back. I'm like, I'm happy to pay for it, man. I said, but I can't believe you've responded this fast, this late at night. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we're happy to take care of you. I've, uh, you know, you've already given me your address. It's here's the order number. It's on its way. So, I wanted to give Leopold. Well, a thanks, shout -out. Leopold. That's awesome. Yeah, that is fantastic. That is awesome. Well, cool, I, know man. You're, so, I know you're well, a Leopold guy, so I thought I'd throw that in there. Oh yeah, yeah, they're good scopes. I think I'm probably maybe more of a Vortex guy now, but I'm torn between the two. So I have equal, equal Leopold and Vortex. Great, great, great companies. Uh, so the, the, you fix it, you feel the expedient fixing of it. Uh, one time was so my first time to Afghanistan. I was using a, uh, Brunton Optimus multi-fuel stove, little backpacker stove Yep. for cooking our food and stuff. Uh, and I miss, I lost the little, uh, curved piece of metal that deflected the jet that actually made the jet come out. The little piece snapped off. So you ended up just the straight, like, um, lighter flame it wouldn't actually turn to that would work at all <laughs> but i found a quarter in my pocket from it was in my pocket from as we flew over there so i took the quarter and rocks and beat the hell out of the quarter and made it a concave dish shape enough to fit and made the stove work just fine and took pictures and sent it back to brunton <laughs> i'm like hey thanks for that and then another thing was our pvs 14s our night vision which is probably archaic now but they were cool at the time the battery cap at the back would have loose contact problems sometimes. And so we would take the silver bubblegum wrapper. Yep. And just fold it over and over and over with the silver on the outside and stick it behind the battery cap and clap it, snap it closed. And it would make the nods work perfect. The night vision work yep. perfect. So much so that I was in a the Scottsdale gun club when they had just opened and some guy had bought some rich dude had bought some night vision and they weren't working right. And he was having trouble with it. And I walked over I'm like, Hey, you, excuse me. Uh, 
I, I have advice for you. Like, check this out. And I got the look like, we know what we're talking about. Why are you, you know, bothering us? <laughs> and I gave him the trick. He's like, I'm not putting a gum wrapper in my nod. And I'm like, fine. <laughs> you don't want him to work. Don't worry about it. So I love that you used a pop top and a zip tie to get him working. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I'm like, man, I need this to finish out my hunt. So I want to bring up two things before the podcast is over. I'm not okay. saying we're ending now, but there's just two things I want to talk about. One, I ran into a fan, which is kind of a rare thing. Every once in a while, I'm somewhere and somebody recognizes me or what I do. And I was out at a sporting clay shoot for Ronald McDonald Charities and had a wonderful time out there. And I was, we ran into the squad in front of us and they were all um, from an online training course that I think we're going to try and do a partnership with. So I don't want to say it yet. We'll figure it out. Anyway, I'm talking to her. Uh, like, so what do you do? I said, oh, I just kind of do a little bit of this and there. She's like, oh, what's your name? I said, uh, Ryan Kleckner. And I shook her hand and she goes, wait, who would you say? Because people are shooting. I said, Ryan Kleckner. She goes, shut up. I said, uh, okay. She was actually a really big fan and it completely made my day so much so that I remembered it till now. So it was so cool. She's, can I take a picture with you? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> this is awesome. I get to be, feel like I'm a celebrity. So I took a picture with her. And she went on to the next stage, and the squad behind us came up, and they're like, hey, who's that girl? And I don't know why. And I said, well, you're taking a picture with her. We thought she was like a celebrity or something. <laughs> like, no, <laughs> nobody, right here. This is your celebrity. <laughs> uh... So it was great. So I uh, ended up talking to her you know, a couple more times to keep bumping into it. And again, it just like made my day, tickled pink experience. It was really great. Um, she was super cool. And um, yeah. Yeah, so we'll see if something comes out of it. So that was one thing to bring up. The other is I came up with and found the absolute stupidest product I've ever seen. So <laughs> real quick, uh, Vanessa was her name. So Vanessa, if you're listening, awesome. Thanks for coming and saying hi, and thanks for geeking out. It was pretty cool. Um, so the stupidest product I've seen in the firearms industry it is the safety bullet. Have you seen this thing, Jason? The safety bullet? Yes, like safe T bullet. No. Okay. So I'm going to look right now. Oh. So not only is this the stupidest, most unsafe product I've ever seen in the firearms industry that I can think of, I might think of something else that I can think of right now. Uh, apparently the guy that does it just likes to bully people around in the firearms industry that have the opinion I do. People say things like, uh, dude, that's a bad idea. And he just, uh, from every story I've heard, does not handle that well and decides to argue and, and get mad at people. So I don't know what that's going to solve. Anthony Hansen says, that jams your slide? Yes, that's exactly the one. So what it is, Jason, everyone listening, it is a, it is a cartridge that has a Delrin plastic bullet. I'm going to use quote fingers, bullet. I'm looking at it. doesn't actually leave the case. So it's locked in the case. And instead, when you fire it, it hits the primer. It's a live primer. And it shoots like a needle through the Delrin plastic bullet and allows the Delrin plastic bullet that is already cut and segmented to expand. So as the needle gets pushed through like a nail, it expands the outsides of the bullet and wedges it so tightly into your chamber or into your barrel that you then cannot move the slide back on the pistol because the ex uh, assuming the extractor doesn't you know slip over the base of the brass there. So what it does is it makes your firearm inert, inoperable, useless, makes it a paperweight. So apparently the concept is you store one in your gun when it's around your house. So in case a kid gets it and picks it up and pulls the trigger, not only do they not hurt anybody, they've now rendered the gun useless so they can't fix it and then hurt somebody. So, do you see any problems with this? Uh, other than if I really needed it and it was there, I wouldn't be able to use my gun. Yes. So, one is, how do you know that someone that wasn't supposed to mess with your gun messed with it when you weren't there? Right. right. And goes, Pow! Oops, that didn't work, and I put the gun back. So problem number one is you have no idea if someone has already done that to your gun. So it, <laughs> the other problem is 
I like what Anthony's are saying. Yeah, what if they rack the slide first? Well, great question, Anthony. Apparently, the manufacturer recommends that you buy two safety bullets and you put one in the chamber and one at the top of the magazine. So in case they rack the slide first, what they end up doing is putting another safety bullet in the chamber. So ha ha, you fooled them. So if they do it that time, it won't work. Again, you don't know that your gun is disabled. When you're looking at it, you have no idea that it's disabled for the next time you go to use it. Huge problem, problem number one. Problem number two is that you assume that that now means you can leave the gun out and accessible to children. That falls into the biggest problem I have with gun safety, which is the, oh, don't worry, it's not loaded argument. You have to have the same lack of control as the don't worry, it's not loaded argument as the don't worry, it's got a safety bullet argument in it. Well, wait a minute. That means now you're going to allow it to be out in the open where kids can access it without adult supervision. That means you're going to walk point of people, not safety rules. You're going to break all just because it has a quote, a safety bullet in it or quote, because it's unloaded. That's another problem I have with it is somehow that you can now handle the gun or treat the gun in a way that you normally wouldn't treat the gun. I got a huge problem with that. You treat the gun the same every time you always treat the gun like it's loaded. So that problem that drives me nuts right there. The other is, what about a stressful situation? Are you going to remember to rack the gun twice before you go to shoot it to get these bullets out? The other problem is, when do guns malfunction most? Do they malfunction when you pull the trigger and the striker or the hammer falls? Or do they malfunction most in the cycle of function, meaning the extraction, ejection, cocking, feeding, chambering, and locking? No. Uh, the latter. So you literally are doing to the gun the entire cycle of operations that's most likely to cause a malfunction twice before you even use the cartridge i just don't get it and they're saying there's no way a live round could shove in behind that and then fire and possibly blow up the gun correct because it's filling the chamber so the bullet doesn't leave so the case and the bullet all stay together oh i got you okay so it's done you can't get the slide back because the cartridge case is there now they set they send a special tool that helps you get it undone which is a rod that goes down the front of the barrel and just pushes that needle back in. So the pedals, the bullet collapse, a quote unquote bullets, so then it can be extracted and be used. But the problem is I've seen videos of guys just taking it and jamming it on the table and it extracts itself. Anyway, it's strong enough to pull out. Cause it's only the friction of the Delrin in there. The other is the special tool is the same as a pencil. So I just, I, <laughs> And this guy gets apparently, apparently really upset when you go, no, that's kind of an unsafe idea. You're now not only have no idea that someone may have done this to your gun when you weren't looking. And most people that have a bedside gun don't touch it for a year at least. And it could be disabled this entire time. Uh, I'll skip to number three in the order we did them. You'll forget that it's there and pick up the gun in a stressful situation and pull the trigger and now completely disable your gun. Because right. now you can't even cycle it and fix it. Your gun's done. You were out of the fight. Or you're going to forget to rack it twice. Or by racking it twice, you now just made it most likely to malfunction instead of just being able to shoot a bad guy. And then my biggest one is you're now going to treat the gun different. And he can't say that's not true or else there'd be no reason for the product. You clearly are going to treat the gun different or else you'd have it locked up. So when he says, we have it in there in case a kid gets a hold on it. Well, you should have it locked up so a kid can't get access to it. Correct. The only reason you'd have this thing at all is that you're going to say, don't worry, it's got a safety bullet in it and put it in there. So no, it is not a joke. It it just boggles my mind that this product is out there. Uh, please, everybody, do not rely on the safety bullet. Uh, kids should never be able to access your firearms unsupervised by an adult. Have them locked up. The fact that they're unloaded or that you think the kid doesn't know where they are or that it's got a safety bullet in it, which literally makes your gun not work, it's crazy. I mean, I don't put sugar in my gas tank every night in case someone steals my truck. Right. <laughs> I don't know why you would do well, that. Well, and, and, and like you said, though, you don't want to get out of the practice of it. I mean, it's only happened a few times in my life, but there's been a time where I thought a gun was unloaded and I was going through it and I pointed it in a safe direction and it surprised me and fired, you know, out in the field. You know, like, holy shit, this should have never happened. And then mm. go through the thing. But the the practice of even though I thought it was unloaded at the time and I went through the motions anyway, you know, and I was by myself, nobody was with me, but 
what if somebody was? So no, I, I'm a firm believer in always pointing a safe direction and all the rules and tips that you should be following with gun safety. Yeah, the only no thing this what. thing has any viability is if they assume that someone's going to say, oh, I can do something different now because the safety bullet's in there. And if yeah. not, then there's no need for the product. So I just don't get it. So I knew we need to announce the last giveaway of our awesome, awesome sponsor, MagTech Ammo. Uh, Jackie put this one up and uh, picked the winner. And she didn't tell him yet because she wanted it to be a surprise in the podcast. So I'm going to surprise him. So there's a surprise for the winner and a surprise for me. So the winner is Bobby P. from Woodway, Texas. Bobby, we have all your information. Jackie will get right out to you. And congratulations, man. You won some free ammo from MagTech. And thank you to MagTech for being so cool that they're willing to give away a box of whatever ammo we pick every single podcast just because they want to help the listeners out there and they want feedback on what you liked about the ammo or, or, or what your thoughts are. Now, the surprise for me is Jackie sent me the text and said, hey, the winner of the Sport 44 Remington Magnum 240 grain SJSP. Dude, do you know what Sport 44 Remington Magnum 240 grain ammo is? I do not. I know the 44 Magnum part. What is Sport? I have no idea. I don't even know what a 44... I know what a 44 Magnum is, but not a 44 Remington Magnum. I have no idea. Semi-jacketed soft point, I guess is what SJSP stands for. I feel so embarrassed, and I can't believe I'm admitting this, but when I read that, I think it's the first time I've ever read something about a cartridge went, what the heck is that? And Jackie and I had a good laugh about it. I'm like, (laughs) what did you pick to give away? And she goes, it was on the list. You told me to pick something on the list, and I did. So she picked something that she thought looked cool. And she goes, I looked online, and it's really expensive. I said, well, good. Somebody will be happy. But you just limited the pool of people that are going to enter the contest down to about two. <laughs> that know what the heck that is. Are you so looking I'm up look- right now? I am. So uh, right here it says the 44 Remington Magnum, or simply 44 Magnum. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. I had no idea it was the same as just 44 Magnum. Well, interesting. Look at that. I never knew it was a Remington cartridge. All right. It makes a lot of sense. If it was just 44 Magnum, it would make... Okay. All is right with the world now. All right. 44 Mag semi-jacketed soft point makes an awful lot of sense. But the Remington Mag made no sense to me. Oh, and you know what? She might have wrote S and B. And since it was a text, it may have autocorrected to sport. That's probably what it was. All right. Yep, because they they yeah S and B makes forty four rem mag, S J S P. There it is. Mystery solved. All right. right. Do know a little bit about guns. I just didn't (laughs) know it was called a rem mag. You didn't know it was a rem mag either, did you? (laughs) No. All I've ever heard of my life is forty four mag, man. All the way back to the Dirty Harry days. Yeah, I I would I would have guessed Winchester. Would you have? If you had to guess who designed it. As far as who designed it? Yeah. Uh, I never would have picked Remington. Yeah, I mean, the only 44 Mag... Because Remington doesn't make a 44 Magnum revolver. You you think it would be either Smith & Wesson or Colt or... Or or Ruger or one of those guys. Yeah. Yeah. But apparently Remington developed that cartridge. Pretty cool. Well, that would be like the 7 Mag, right? That's a Remington cartridge. Yes, but they make rifles. Yeah, but I mean, you don't know. It. I sense. don't know it as a seven millimeter Remington mag. I know it as a seven mag. Oh, you don't? That's funny. So I know that one's a seven millimeter Remington Magnum and a three hundred Win Mag. So the three hundred Win Mag and the seven millimeter Remington Mag were the two kind of competing with each other. They came out at the same time, and they were like the two offerings that people were trying to do. So anyway, someone's asking about the update for the book. No, the only update is Jackie's waiting on me to prove the letter that goes out to everybody and says it is beyond absurd that I've kept deposits this long even though I've offered twice to everybody to refund money that optional, if you don't want to keep waiting because it's, it's disgusting that I, I keep it. it bothers, seriously, if you can't tell yet, it really, really bothers me when people do this kind of thing. So it bothers me when I do it um, is I've offered it and then people still get upset about it. I get it. You should be upset, but I've offered and people don't take it up. So now what I'm doing is this next letter is going out. So it's official now that says you're getting your money back, whether you want it back or not, because I'm refunding everyone's pre-orders. The book will get done. But guys, Mayday Safety is taking all of my time right now, and that's a good thing. Uh, we're trying to save kids' lives. We're li- like, of all the things that I've gotten my name out there for, uh, I'm I'm hoping 
that Mayday Safety is my legacy, not because I want to be famous with it, but because that's how important I think it is. So uh, you can write me an email and tell me uh, how I should finish the books. You can learn how to shoot better and not try and save kids' lives, but I'm going to disagree with you. And that's <laughs> not that's not a saying that um, that is right that I did it. It's, it's wrong that I've done it. It's wrong that I took pre-orders. I'll never do that again. It's wrong that I didn't get the book done in time. Uh, my fault. It's still a lot of cool things I'm developing in there and coming up with even new things that I, I have. I'm actually have one thing I need to figure out how to name it because it's a new theory I've kind of figured out here on ballistic coefficients, uh, or I think I have anyway. So the letter is going out to everyone that says, you're getting a refund. You are getting off the list of pre-orders. And if you do not confirm your address, I'm sending the check to the last address I got. Or I'll donate it if you don't want the check back. But either way, I'm going to cross you off my list as no longer having any pre-orders just because I feel bad um, and it's not right to you guys. So there's the update on it. Sorry, guys. Drew says he picked up three of the kids' books on Amazon to donate to his daughter's school. Awesome, man. I appreciate you doing that. He says it had the old title on it. Well, we need to check that out. Drew, will you please send me an email? Uh, info at ryancollector.com. Let's figure those details out because I want to make sure everything's working okay. Um. Anything else you got, Jason? No, no, man. I'm sitting pretty good, actually. Uh, someone just commented, long-time listener, first-time watcher, just downloaded the app. Just going to leave the book thing alone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. I It bothers me because it's it's not right. I, I, I It wouldn't bother me so much if it wasn't my fault. So I, I hear people all the time say, oh, you're too hard on yourself about it. Or other people say, yeah, I'm pissed at you. But either way, yeah, it's, it's whatever. It does it does bother me. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have had it done that way. I don't like how it went down. So we'll get it fixed. Um. So yeah, safety bullet. Got to meet a cool fan shooting. Oh, dude, I I also forgot. Jason, here's what I forgot. I forgot how much I loved clay target shooting. Oh, I have a story about that. Actually, go ahead. Well, I just I think it had been three years since I took my over and under out of the safe. That's Since I've been time. in Tennessee, I'm like, it's been three years. And I used to shoot clay targets, you know, for moving to Connecticut once a week, probably. And it was, I wasn't as bad as I thought I was going to be. It was actually good taking three years off because a lot of the problem with shooting clays, I think, is getting in your head too much. So it was nice to not be in my head too much and go out and just have some fun. But dude, I'm so excited. I've already sent the email to the gun club that I'm getting a corporate membership just so I can have my company on there so I can go down and shoot a lot more because. Dude, I love the rifle range, obviously, and the pistol range, but something about going and shooting clays, especially like sporting clays or just around a trap or skeet real quick, is just something about it is so much more fun of an experience. Oh, it is. Than just going to the range and just shooting rifles and, okay, we're done. So it was fun. Paris asked what my over and under is. It is a Breda Silver Pigeon 2. That's what I shoot. I forgot to... So what's your story, Jason? Well, back to my hunting trip. I, I meant to tell you about the highlights. Um, so we took the pellet rifle with us. Okay. And, and we found some clay pigeons laying around. And we set these things up on a berm at 100 yards. And we're hitting clay pigeons at 100 yards after figuring out the wind and everything with the pellet. <laughs> it was a blast. Bull crap. I am not kidding you. It took me... I could do it within 10 shots. I couldn't do it the first shot. I mean, it was kind of too sporadic, and Jared would call it out, you know, just above it, a little bit left. All right. I might believe that. That sounds cool. It was a blast. But even now, the, I mean, it broke it, obviously, but there was enough interfaces. Oh, yeah. No, it usually just either knock a piece off or knock the center out of it. Um, I mean, you could certainly see that you hit it. That's pretty cool, dude. So dude, I'm having fun with the air rifles is, as I think I told you guys, I, yes, I told you, I'm down coaching the 4-H air rifle team now. So if you guys that have been begging me for courses, uh, just disguise yourself as a high school student and go join 4-H. Because I realized I was talking to them, you know, last time. I was just having so much fun. I'm having them call their shots. I'm having the other students that aren't shooting being coaches. So they're back there talking. I'm like, uh-uh, stop. Get up here. Everyone get next to a shooter and get like your eyeballs next to their hand and watch what they're doing. Don't look at the target and coach them. And at the end, I want you to tell them something they're doing good and something they need to improve on. And I'll see like, you know, horrible trigger control from a couple of people away. And I'll walk up to the coach. I go, hey, coach, watch that trigger control the next few shots. And I want you to describe to me what you're seeing. 
like, okay. And they get done, they describe it to me. I'm like, all right, did you see that? Why was that was bad or why that was good? Dude, I'm having so much fun because these kids are just absorbing it all. And they're phenomenally better shooters in a few weeks. All their groups have really shrunk down. They're really understanding what's going on. They're understanding natural point of aim. They're calling their shots. They're getting good trigger control. And I'm so happy that they get done on the line. And they go to walk down and check the targets. And I'll run in front and I'll go, stop. What did you call? What did you call? And I'll go down the whole line and go, all right, let's go see if those matched. And then instead of just like drilling through it and being done, like I think they used to do before, I'm bringing them all the way down to the first target. And as a group, we're walking from target to target and analyzing what we can do better. And uh, they seem to be loving it. We're taking a lot longer because we're really getting the nitty gritty of shooting. And I can see now that some of the adults, some of the parents are really liking it. They're leaning forward and the dads are starting to listen and people are getting involved. And I laughed about it because, yeah, because people are asking about courses. I'm like, here I am giving free courses away. (laughs) <laughs> on a weekly basis to these kids which i'm glad to do um so there you go if you you live in williamson county tennessee you can uh you can get your kid into 4-h and you i, I can be your kid's coach uh once a week for a year so I, i'm so excited to see how good they get at the end of the year because the kids are really paying attention so far and it's only been a few weeks and they're getting a lot better so that's cool yeah, and then I have to give a shout out to my dad too because then we started a new hunting game. While okay. We were breaking did, the it, did it involve frisbee golf? Nope, no frisbee golf. That wouldn't have been fair to nobody. So. so that's serious in our family, real quick. Sorry, Jason, in case no one knows, it's very serious. <laughs> and I'm out there zinging a frisbee in my front yard like last week for the dogs. And one of my kids is like, How do you get it to fly straight? I'm like, Well, I need to teach you. And I got all into it. And April just rolled her eyes. She's like, oh, my God. Collectors are so proud about being able to throw a Frisbee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so tell me, what's the new game? Uh, so <laughs> we started this game on the hunting trip. I don't know what it was. It was time of year. Um, I don't know. But there were these grasshoppers, dude, and they were everywhere. And they were mm-hmm. huge. They didn't even yeah, the ones that if you sneak up behind, you can pick them up while they kick you? Yeah, they sound like a Harley Davidson when they jump. I mean, they, <laughs> yeah. they're they're well, we massive. We used to see those out of Mormon Lake, those real yeah. big ones, right? Yeah. yeah. So they're they're everywhere right now. Uh-huh. So of course we got bored with the clay pigeons. So now we have grasshoppers walking out in front of us, right? So I'm like, ah, new targets, guys. <laughs> well, <laughs> the thing is, at thirty to forty yards through my BB gun, it looks just like everything else. I mean, it looks like all the rocks. I mean, you it doesn't zoom in yeah, enough. Yeah. So we're sitting there trying to explain to each other through binoculars where it's at and where it's moving. Pretty, pretty soon you can see it moving, right? Mm-hmm. Dude, my dad kicked our rear ends at shooting grasshoppers. Really? He was a dead eye, man. He he couldn't miss. Yeah. It was, it was kind of a my, slap slap I in think the butt. Our dads have the same thing. Wow. Even when I came back from the military and I was probably the best rifle shooter I'm ever going to be from all the training, my dad and I did something, you know, just the father son thing. You know, he thinks he knows better than me. I'm like, no, trust me. I know better than you now how to shoot a rifle. And I think he handily outshot me. Just frustrates. Yeah. <laughs> your eyes should be worse than me. You don't know what you're talking about <laughs> and you can still shoot better than me. It's, it's kind of like old man strength. It's old man shooting ability. It's great. Good news is we're getting to be old men now. So that means we're <laughs> now. that's right. And to Robert, no, no, these aren't locusts. We have those two here. But, no, these are uh, grasshoppers. These are, these are grasshoppers. Grasshoppers. You can actually grab them by their back wings. They have the giant legs. You can actually yeah. see the little, like, spikes on the back of their legs, and they'll kick the snot out of you, but you can pick them up and grab them. I'd say bodies about the size of my pinky. Are bigger, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're big things. Yeah. Yeah, maybe they are locusts. I don't know, but we always call them grasshoppers, and they only come a certain time of year out there. And you got that horny toad out there. I put a pictures up there on Instagram. So thanks for sharing the pictures of that. People thought that was kind of oh, cool. Oh, yeah, I've never seen one that color ever. I've only seen brown ones. So did you guys ever pose with a grasshopper that you shot? Did you ever see me pose with that uh, groundhog that I got? I did. I did. <laughs> that was like awesome. a year or two ago. I put it way. I put it like fifteen feet in front of me. So it looked so like it, looked it was like, as big as you. Yeah, it looked like a bear sitting in front of me. Please tell me you guys did that with a grasshopper. No, we weren't smart enough to do that. I wish we would have because fun. it was awesome. And like I said, it was great for dad because dad, so I finally told him, I said, dude, either you are getting super lucky because I am all around this thing and can't hit it for some reason. And here he is just knocking them down left and right. Yeah, man. They, 
they had to learn to shoot without all those technological advantages now and people are shooting further and better than ever before that's not because we're better shooters it's because we have better technology and better equipment and better manufacturing you know guys in civil war rifles were making better shots than we we're making today so there's something to be said about having to learn the fundamentals the old way you know it's like we talked about reading map and compass before before there's gps right you, know, you and i are jumping to ballistic calculators now we're using scopes and things like that so it's super cool that uh that they're doing that you know what else is a fun target for like pellet guns or 22 is butter packets you ever do that no so uh the little you know butter packets like at a old-fashioned restaurant or a cafeteria they come in the, like the paper wrapper yep almost like a little miniature thin mint you know what i'm talking about i know exactly what you're talking about those those are fun to shoot so you put those out there really far the 22 when you hit them they turn to snow because the impact of that bullet hitting it just vaporizes and it's a, a mist and you can see like snow sprinkle down after you hit them and there's a loud thwack when it hits the paper so with a pellet gun you can do them too you put them out there far enough it's kind of like a little mini tannerite target out of out of butter <laughs> for shooting paper so it's a really good thing to do so that's pretty cool yeah that's i'll never forget tannerite my first experience with tannerite with you and my wife and her so excited swinging around yeah do you remember that in the we no, you reminded me before, but that's funny. No, yeah, we, we were shooting it, and I think uh, Uncle Bobby was a little worried about what we were blowing up out in the woods, wasn't he? Yeah, I think he told us we finally had to go further down the road. <laughs> and we told him, we've got the Tannerite. <laughs> <laughs> so Ringing Iron said, saw an article about shooting flying insects with Smooth Road 22. Is, yeah, I, I've mentioned that before, doing it. I actually made some people mad. Uh, I had two letters uh, one email and two letters written to me about how uh, bees are important to our environment and I shouldn't be shooting bees. And they're right. They're absolutely right. We have a serious bee problem. So much so that my wife wants to get beehives and start raising bees on our property just because it's kind of like epidemic level. We got a problem with bees. But carpenter bees, I know they're good pollinators, but they're destroying my house. I don't want them destroying my house. <laughs> So I think I'm doing them a favor. When I kill the ones that destroy my house, I'm getting them out of the gene pool. So I'm only letting the ones that don't want to destroy houses survive. So in the long run, I think I'm going to let more bees live. <laughs> so sorry about that, everybody. Yes, it's definitely a thing. Lots of people do it. Maybe we shouldn't, but I, I appreciate you guys care enough and listen enough to write in and, and listen. So uh, maybe, I don't want to say the dates when I'm going, but we're going pretty soon for that uh, New Mexico hunt. Yes. That 300 uh, PRC is going to be awesome. I can't wait to find and smack an elk with it. And I think Jason is going to be using a Q rifle in 308. And guys, you're awesome. Thanks for listening. Support our sponsors. Uh, they are my products, which are Mayday Safety, which, man, we can't keep up with. Just got back from a private schools conference talking about that. And, you know, police departments and jurisdictions and schools and businesses are all taking Mayday Safety to help manage the safety and, you know, crowdsource emergency alerts and communication we think that's awesome so keep spreading the word please and one of the things i need most good feedback on the app stores go download it use it for free with your family and then give us some love back that really really helps think about getting your ffl go check out rocket ffl uh that thing's still booming and i love it we're actually putting more courses up there right now i've i've uh i've prioritized the rest of the ffl courses in front of the second book because they'll be easier to get finished and get done. So it's just one of those uh, business decisions. So get in there and get your FFL going so you can get the more courses after that. People love it. Uh, many, many, many people make it through the course and just love the idea that they're actually getting video training by someone who's done it many times before and who's been through hundreds of inspections uh, where there's other people out there doing the courses that may have a lot of years experience selling the course guides, but they even admit that they've never even been through an inspection themselves. So support rocket ffl i'd appreciate it and then magtech ammo guys magtech and snb and cbc we've been honest about it we've told you the good and bad about our experiences with it there's some products that i would probably grab magtech first over anything else for certain purposes especially you know plinking nine mil ammo guys i'm going for the magtech the stuff's amazing go yep. look at viking tactics instagram page kyle lamb's instagram page and look at a picture of me with that little p365 there's a 10 yard group of 10 rounds that are like this. It should be like ultra match ammo out of a match rifle and or, or a match handgun. No, it was Magtech 9 mil. The stuff's amazing. Jason's done some clean tests with it. Go, go check it out. 
And then there's other stuff that he's been honest about. Being like, hey, we tried some of the 308 for the match. It didn't work as good for him. The 223 does. Hopefully that means you guys can still trust our opinions. And we appreciate their support. And we appreciate the support you guys give. Jason, do you have anything else you'd like to tell anybody? No, I'm sure I have a million other things to say. But it's late. <laughs> Save them for next time. Take some notes, please. And if you don't mind, put together a Jason Kleckner's Butchering 101 because uh, I'd like to learn about it. Yeah, absolutely. I'll put together some stuff. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care, Jason. Thanks, everybody. All right. Bye.